Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. My name is Pastor Clint Lang. It's March 21st, 2021. Hard to believe that it's spring already. The birds have returned and are singing and the snow is melting. And soon we're going to be seeing new growth and new life. Well, I pray also that, spiritually speaking, that this will be a season for us to experience new growth and new life as well. So I'm just really glad that you can uh, join with me today to open God's Word. God's Word is so precious and He loves us so much. There's so many good things. And as we approach um, the Easter season, next week is Palm Sunday, the week after is Easter. Today, I really want to get down to some of the core essential things that we need to be reminded of. And maybe you're out there today and what I'm going to tell you today is new to you. If you're tuning into this broadcast and you've never watched a church service online, or maybe you've watched, but you've never heard what I'm going to say today, I'd pray that you'd open your heart and let the Holy Spirit uh, speak to you today. We're going to be talking about one of the most important topics in the Christian faith. That is understanding the grace of God. Now, before we begin, I'd like to say a word of prayer. Would you bow with me in prayer today? Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that you care so much for us, that you came to the earth to give yourself as a, a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, God, that you care about each person that's out there today listening to this broadcast. I pray, God, that people would be encouraged, that people would be strengthened, but people, Father, as well, that are hearing this would be drawn to you. People that don't know you would be be drawn to you and they would open their hearts to you and see how good you are. And I praise you and I thank you, God, for this day that you have made. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I pray that the Lord would guide my lips today as I bring this message to you. God's grace. Did you know that 16 books of the New Testament are started out with uh, a phrase that has this in it? Grace and peace be to you. Different ways of putting it, but 16 books of the New Testament start out with this phrase, grace and peace be to you. Now there's a reason why um, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and the Apostle John use this greeting at the beginning of some of their letters. Um, it wasn't just a formal introduction. The Apostles genuinely recognized the importance of grace and peace in a believer's life. People are in need of God's grace and peace. And in this message, I'm going to be focusing in on grace. What is the definition of true grace? And how does God's grace work within? That's going to be the focal point of my message today. Now, grace is one of the deepest and most profound principles in Christian teaching. Webster's Dictionary defines grace as this, unmerited divine assistance given to man for his regeneration or sanctification. Now, it's interesting. I, I think it's really interesting, actually, that a secular dictionary defines grace in this way. Now, I think it's a pretty good definition, and it really speaks the original intention of the apostles when they said, grace be to you. What, what, he, what they're saying is that uh, God may God's unmerited divine assistance be given to you for your regeneration and your sanctification. Now, that's deep. I'd like to expand upon this definition and use it as a framework. So, when we look at this definition, the first thing that we need to understand about grace is that grace is is given unmerited. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 say this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So what this is saying is that grace cannot be earned by good deeds. Now there's still people out there that are trying to earn God's grace from the things that they do. Some people are genuinely good in their behavior and they live their lives almost flawlessly, but 
they're obedient for reasons that are outside of the reason that God is looking for, outside of love for God. The righteousness that God requires cannot be earned by good deeds, by legalistically doing what is right. You know, the, the Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus' day, they were out, outwardly obedient to the Old Testament laws. But Jesus referred to these men as whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. Pretty strong words. But this is because their righteous living was, was not fueled out of love for God, but it was actually fueled by human pride. Now naturally, in our flesh, in our human flesh, it's our natural instinct to try and be self-sufficient and to accomplish things on our own. Our pride rises within us and we say, I can do it. When our good deeds are powered by human pride and self-resolve, we underestimate our own abilities to be good and we underestimate the power of sin in the heart to keep us from being truly good. Now, this is why Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 5.20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Pharisees, they were, they were outwardly polished. They carefully followed all of the rules. Now, the Apostle Paul, at one point, before he became a believer in Jesus, he was one of their order. And listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 3, 4 to 6. He writes this, If anyone else has the mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But as legalistically righteous as Paul was on the outside, he was dead on the inside and he was blind spiritually. That is until Jesus approached Paul on the road to Damascus and opened his eyes and showed him how blind he truly was. The law of God is good, my friends. The law of God is righteous. It is upright. It is holy. But the law has no power to keep us from sinning. We are by very nature's sinners and there's no capacity in our own strength to achieve any level of righteousness that we need to be saved. And this is why Jesus came to establish a new covenant with his people. If the old covenant was good, he would have just come to add to it. But he came to establish a new covenant. He did this to fulfill the law, to enable his good law to be written on the hearts of those who place their trust in him. Case in point, in Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, for the law merely brings awareness of sin. Some people think that if they're just good enough, they're going to earn favor with God and earn a place in heaven. But the law itself reveals to us how we cannot measure up to God's standards when we try. Like the Apostle Paul, who was chief among those who are good in works, we are blind and spiritually impoverished without God's saving grace. We need a Savior. Humanity needs a Savior. You can see it out there in the world. We need a Savior. God wants us to follow Him in good works, yes, but for the right reasons. Not out of human pride, but out of love for Him. But if we try to earn favor with God by just doing good works, when reality strikes and we realize that we're never good enough and that we can't do it on our own, man, that's when disillusionment sets in. And that's when people give up and they stop going to church and they stop following Christ because they, they don't believe they can. They don't want to live a lie and, and, and be a hypocrite. 
And many have wandered away from the faith. Maybe you're hearing this and, and you're saying, yeah, that's me. Maybe you've wandered away from the faith because of this issue, not realizing that maybe your faith has been built on the wrong foundation. I'd like you to consider this. Christianity built on moral principle alone is not enough to give anyone freedom. This sort of religion is, is built on human le- uh, effort to legalistically please God, to live as overcomers. It's not enough to choose to pay homage to God's holy principles. The power of sin is too great for any of us to overcome. In a nutshell, what the scripture is saying here is that his regulations were given to show us that we don't measure up, regardless of how hard we try. Our only hope to save us, our only hope, is God's grace. And God's grace is unmerited. We don't deserve it. It's not earned. It's a free gift from Him. We're sinful and fallen. We don't deserve this gift of grace that's given to us. But Paul says in Romans 3, 21 and 22, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. This leads to my second point. Grace is given for our regeneration. When God created us, he didn't intend for us to be a a bunch of zombies, mind-controlled robots without will. From Adam until now, humanity has collectively chosen to live in rebellion against the Lord, despite our best intentions. The fact is, naturally, we are a band of rebels. Ever since the fall, with disobedience that came from Adam and Eve, the whole world was placed under this death sentence. For God and His holiness and perfection has decreed that the penalty of sin is death. But, Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that being Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all have sinned. Outside of the penalty being paid for us, the death penalty hangs over each and every one of us. There is no escape. But God, you see, he didn't leave us in that state. God, who is abounding in mercy, gave us his grace because he did not want people to face the penalty of death. So he made a way for us to escape it. And this is why the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth. God veiled himself in flesh in order to save us. He came to give his life for us, to die on the cross for us, to make a payment for the debt that he didn't know because he was perfectly sinless. He came and he gave his sinless life to pay a debt that we could not pay on our own. He did this in exchange for, he paid the debt in exchange for his own life. He did this so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be generate, regenerated and brought back into a right relationship with him. This is the essential part of Christianity that some people never really get. And it's so important if you're listening to this today that you ask God to reveal to you the truth of what I'm saying. This is the grace of God that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was raised from the dead and in the process he conquered death paving the way for us to have our offenses washed away so that we could be close to him. It's God's gift to us. It's not earned. When we accept his gift of grace, his Holy Spirit enters into us to create this new life inwardly and outwardly giving us the power to live a life that is pleasing to him. We're regenerated by the life-bringing power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's much like a desert wasteland being transformed by irrigation. When I was in Israel a few years back, I I noticed that um, there was pictures of the land uh, before the irrigation started and then after the irrigation. 
and before the irrigation it was dry, parched wasteland. But truly, the land of Israel today is blossoming because of the irrigation and the waters of life that are flooding onto it. Now, in a similar way, the water of the Holy Spirit, Spirit brings life to the land of our hearts. It brings us from barrenness and dryness into this flourishing tropical paradise full of life. The very word regeneration suggests to us the renewing of something that had been lost. It is through God's unmerited divine assistance that our old nature of our dead and dry fleshly man is put down and the new nature of the living spiritual man takes over. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life, my friends, starts when a truly uh, repentant heart accepts the gift of God and believes. He's sorrowful for the way that he has rebelled against his creator. And he lays down before him everything and believes and says, I will follow you, Jesus. No matter what the cost is, I abandon it all for the sake of your call on me. This is the regenerating grace of God that is given to us and works within us and draws us to himself. Romans 8 1 goes on to tell us, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and of death. So we see the scripture teaches us that God's grace was given for our regeneration, bringing us from spiritual death into spiritual life. But it's more. God's grace is not merely issued to assist in our initiation into the family of God. God's grace is a sustaining influence which enables the believer to persevere and to overcome in the Christian life and to grow into maturity, much like a plant that bears fruit in its time. This brings me to my third point, which is grace is given for our sanctification. That part of the dictionary that talks about sanctification, we're going to speak about that now. A lot of people don't understand what sanctification is. We do our part by believing in the truth and the Holy Spirit does his part by setting us apart from the rest of the world that is lost, by drawing us to salvation. Firstly, beginning the work in us through regeneration, becoming born again in the Spirit. And secondly, through progressive sanctification, which is the transformation and the confirmation of a person's character to be like Jesus was. People have said, that once we become regenerated, we should automatically be completely transformed. And as a re reaction to regeneration, we should live perfectly without ever sinning. Well, this is clearly not the case. You see, although we've been forgiven, and there's a drastic change in our attitudes and our actions, temptation to sin does not cease. We wrestle against our flesh. There's a spiritual man that comes alive and there's a fleshly man that's still here, right? So although we have been forgiven and there's this drastic change in our attitudes and actions, temptation doesn't cease and we need to learn how to follow Christ. When we first receive forgiveness, we start a journey towards heaven. We start to grow in our spirit where eventually we will bear much good fruit. <laughs> A lot of the New Testament is corrective teaching and instruction given on, given on living righteously. You see, if we are perfected in our salvation at the time we first believed, much of this teaching would be unnecessary because we would be fully mature and there would be no room for spiritual growth. It's painfully obvious that I need spiritual growth continually to grow and become more like Jesus. And so do you. Despite our best efforts, we still fail. 
God's grace, you see, is not just given to regenerate us, but it is also given to progressively teach us, to sanctify us, conforming us to the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, imperfection leads many believers to the following thought. You know, I know what it is to receive God's grace at salvation, and I'm thankful, but it seems as though I'm continuing to struggle and to fail to meet the mark of where I should be. What a wretched person I am. Well, this is not a bad thing to recognize in ourselves. When we see our imperfections and we long to live holy lives that are pleasing to God, we should be concerned. We should be grieved. Now, we have a choice. The Spirit allows this to come upon us so that we come to a valley of decision. To yield to the Holy Spirit and be holy even as He is holy, or to yield to our flesh, which is in its core nature hostile, and it cannot uh, obey God. It's hostile to Him. God's grace is such that when we choose to come to Him, and daily surrender our lives to Him as a living sacrifice of love because we want to honor Him, His grace gives us the strength to carry that through. We can't be good on our own. We need His grace, life-giving flow of grace to help us to live godly and obedient lives. For this reason, the Apostle writes, in Romans chapter 6, 12 to 16, Paul says this, Do not present the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death unto life, and present the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Did you catch that? What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Now, have you ever felt as though you'd gone too far away from home? You, 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 you feel like you've drifted too far, feeling ashamed of the foolishness of your decisions that uh, you've done so much that God possibly couldn't forgive you for failing? Are you tired? from fighting the tide that seems to be too much and, and you feel like you want to give up? Are you feeling battered and, and bruised by the assault of this world system of values? Your, your own fleshly desires and, and the enemy just seems to be always trying to get in? Have you made bad decisions, my friend? Have you made bad decisions that have affected your life adversely? Are you thinking, how can God love me after all of me, uh, all of my spurning of his forgiveness and failing to meet his standards? I want you to know today, there is sanctifying grace for you. Call out on the Lord today, my friend. He is a very present help in time of weakness. He understands the feelings of our weaknesses. The Lord loves you. And he wants to pull you out of the mess that you find yourself stuck in. There's grace for you today. It's overcoming grace. It's not just grace to, to wash over what your, your flesh has caught you in. No. This grace is given to help you stand firm in the Lord and to rise as a holy person that's obedient to Christ. God will help you out of the bad place and clean you from the muck you have been stuck in if only you cast yourself onto Him. Have you, have you heard this scripture that I just read today? Have you heard that scripture? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? but under grace? Certainly not. My friends, we don't have to stay in sin. The power of sin has been broken, not because we ourselves can get ourselves out, but because God in his mercy walks beside us. You see, I, I've probably told this story to you before, but I think it's such a good illustration of the Father's love. 
I remember when, when I lived in Terrace and we went down into the river valley to, to cut firewood. I, I was giving my wife a break. So I just took my two younger boys and they were maybe four and six at the time. They weren't very old. And um, I took them with me to cut firewood. I was in the middle of falling and bucking trees and I, I told my six-year-old son to make sure he took care of his four-year-old brother and, and uh, you know, I, I made sure that they were far, like on the other side of my truck from where I was cutting firewood. And I told the six-year-old, you know, stay here and, and take care of your brother. So I was bucking firewood and the boys were playing in the forest. But as I was cutting up this tree, I didn't realize that the boys had wandered away. And then I put my saw down and I looked over to where they were and, and they weren't there. Well, man, I'm, I'm thinking, well, where did they go? Well, they, they wandered off down towards the river and I hadn't seen them go there. But um, anyways, I ran through the forest. I, I was so concerned for their safety and I was concerned for, for not keeping a better eye on them and, focusing in on what I was doing too much where, uh, where they got out of my sight line. The boys had wandered off. So I ran through the woods and they had gone down an embankment and down into this swamp. And um, the swamp was kind of adjacent to where the, the river was flowing and it was a, a mud flat. And uh, the boys, here they were. <laughs> I, I came down there and there they were, stuck up to their waists in this mud right in front of me like I'm like oh my goodness and they're crying and they're they can't get out and you know I, if I wouldn't have come along there they would have perished right there I'm sure they would have died right in that spot um, but being their father you know I'm I, I was I was somewhat cross for them for for Stephen not uh, paying attention to my word to stay close to the truck with his brother but they were children and, and they did foolish things sometimes and, and they got themselves into this pickle. Now, I didn't just stand there and, and say, you know, you guys get yourself out. See how, how that's going to work out for you. No, I, I looked at them and I was filled with love for them and I'm like, oh, you poor boys. You know, they're both crying themselves snotty <laughs> and, and uh, I... I went right into that swamp and I plucked them out of the swamp and I carried them to safety on the shore and we went down and, and cleaned them up as best we could and washed them and, and cleaned them up. And, you know, we had a good talk about it all. And then, you know, this is an example of me being human, but God allows us to have choice too. And he allows us freedom to choose. And sometimes like those children, we get ourselves into bad circumstances. You are a child of God and it doesn't matter how far you think you have fallen. God's grace is sufficient and it covers over you. You are his child. Not because we deserve it, but because of God's grace. Now we understand that when we fall into sin, we're not doing what God wants us to do. And God doesn't reject us for it and push us out on our own and say, hey, you figure it out yourself now that you've got yourself into this mess. He sees the danger, the mortal danger that we're in because sin left unchecked leads to death. God wants to change us. He wants to change your heart. He desires you to be holy just as he is holy, but he understands that you struggle and that you battle and that times there are times that you fall down. This is why it says in 1 John chapter 1, 8 to 10, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. The scripture is for believers. Maybe you've failed, or you've entered into judgment on a person who has failed. Now, if we've been bound by the legalistic thought uh, that... It, our value to God is based upon our own righteousness, then we've been terribly mistaken. You're his child. He values you regardless of decisions that you make. 
There is grace given for us to live. Grace given for us to grow. Grace given to purify us and strengthen us so that we can live holy lives that are pleasing to Him. There's no one who attains favor with God on their own acts of goodness or deeds. The brother or sister who has failed by going into some kind of sin is no less valuable to the Lord than a brother or sister who has not fallen into that particular sin. Now, we can't take pride in our own righteousness as though it were some kind of badge of acceptance from God. God's acceptance of us is based upon His love and His grace and the blood that He shed for us. We're saved by the grace of Jesus alone, not by anything that we do. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here today? Are there rewards for living righteously? Y yes, there is incredible rewards. Living a life of righteousness is beneficial in every way. Are there negative consequences to sins that a believer commits? Yes, there are consequences to those sins, much like there is consequences to my two boys stuck in the swamp crying in fear that because they couldn't get out. But uh, you see, there's consequences to those sins and we may face the pain of those consequences but they don't contribute one iota to God's acceptance of us as his children. Now some people may see what I'm saying and go, yippee, I'm... Uh, I'm I'm free. I can see that God's grace has uh, given me freedom. So, in response to this, I'm going to choose to live the way I want and enjoy it. And enjoy my sin because in the end, God's still going to forgive me. Now, John says this in 1 John 1, 6 and 7. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we have that attitude, my friends, I have to question whether we actually are saved. No. You see, God's grace is not a license for immoral living. God's grace, when we really understand it and when we accept Jesus as our Savior, ought to pierce our heart. And, and make us sorrowful for our behaviors that are, are, uh, are wrong. Um, the scripture refers to people choosing to walk in the lifestyle of darkness with this attitude that I just explained here. They lie and do not live by the truth. It must be emphasized that God's grace is not a license to commit sin and live in wickedness. That philosophy is a deception straight from the pit of hell. And the devil delights when people embrace it because he knows it leads to death. God wants us to be righteous, to act righteously, and to be holy. But we can't do it alone. We need God's grace to pluck us from our sinful um, ways, our sin nature. The scripture teaches us, that we are to strive to be righteous. We are to make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Him. That's the scripture as well. It's a partnership with Him. For us to overcome, we must keep in step with the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, the Apostle Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sin nature. It's clear that only when we keep in step with the Holy Spirit and yield to Him complete control of our lives, will we ever attain the holiness that he desires? And this is the secret for living in victory over sin, to walk in union with the Holy Spirit. We must be in communication with our Heavenly Father. We must also be willing to submit our rebellious tendencies to his authority and be mindful of his instructions. Just like I was disappointed with my children, God's disappointed in our behavior when we stray from His commands because He knows that we're going to have to face negative consequences for our actions. And depending on the circumstances, I might even have to punish my children to help curb destructive behavior. But being, that being said, I would not stop loving them or helping them to learn. 
The same can be said with God. There may be disciplinary action. Treat hardship as discipline. God disciplines you if you're his child. And if you don't undergo the discipline of God when you're making bad decisions, you're really not his child. God will discipline you if you're making bad decisions to curb your behavior. People of God, the Lord wants us to live pure and holy lives. That's his goal. He wants us to be imitators of him. But our failures do not separate us from the love of God and our acceptance by him as, as his children. This point is the point of grace and a point so often misunderstood. It's a liberating point when you come to actually understand it and realize it. He knows that when we really get to know his heart for us, and we come to understand how much he really loves us as, 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 as our father, that this will change our behavior and make us want to please him and want to be close to him and want to walk in the spirit with the knowledge that he knows what's best for us. God does not want to change our behavior to come to him. He wants us to come to him first of all and be changed on the inside by him when we come. You see what I'm saying? Behavior is important, but it's how we get there that makes all the difference between abundant living in Jesus as he is designed and being bound up by the deadness of legalism like that of the scribes and the Pharisees. God's grace towards us is his unmerited assistance in regards to our regeneration and our sanctification. If you've ever experienced this regeneration that I'm speaking of, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, Jesus offers to you today water from the Spirit that will satisfy your thirsty soul and will save you from the penalties of your sins. Come to Jesus today, my friends. Come to Him. Lay your burdens down. Lay your concerns down before Him. If you will only believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him to forgive you and wash you clean, you will be saved. If you make this decision today, I, I would counsel you to connect with another believer who knows Jesus that you know knows Jesus. Or you can call me at Hillside Community Church and, and I'd love to talk to you about it all and help you on your journey into a born-again life. And maybe you're listening today and, and you're saying, Pastor, I, I can really identify with what you're saying. I'm a believer, but I've pushed away from God because of my shame. I've been sinning. I don't feel worthy to be forgiven. Know this, my brother or sister, that the Lord loves you and he wants you to know that you're his child. God's grace is given for your regeneration, but also for your sanctification. He wants to make you like Jesus. Jesus is calling. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to give him your burdens, and he wants to give you his rest. Ask for forgiveness, and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Lay down your struggles. He's familiar with your weaknesses and your failures. You've been trying so hard to do things on your own steam. Or maybe you've just given up and you've gone headlong back into a life of, of sin. God wants to turn you from that. And he gives you his grace and the strength to change. This isn't something you can work yourself up to. The Holy Spirit will give you strength to change. If you walk in step with him, yes, he will ask you to choose. But he'll give you his power to make the choice to be holy, even as he is holy. Now, King David, he wasn't a perfect man, but he was called a man after God's own heart. And what made David this kind of man was his motives for serving God. In closing, I would like you to pray a prayer with me. The prayer of King David in Psalm 25, 4 to 11. Let's make this scripture our prayer in closing. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, 
For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways, and he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All of the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and his face shine upon you. I pray that this prayer that King David prayed would be your prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.